Emily and Georgina, thank you so much for spending your time and hanging out with us tonight. State University has become kind of a leader in terms of audio description and, and thinking critically about audio description. I don't, I don't know of, of similar classes and programs really anywhere else in, in the States. So you should all feel very proud and privileged about that. We're trying to provide a critical examination of the meaning, place, and role of disability within our institution. And of course, we recognize disability as part of the broad spectrum of human diversity. And that, the, re the other reason that I wanted that I'm sort of so impressed by the crowd and the diversity of the crowd really has to do with the fact that, of what's sort of underwriting this whole purpose um, for me in this conversation. And that is that inclusion benefits all of us. Uh, in the field of blindness, the main tool for access accommodations is what we call audio description. Um, and in this conversation, we hope to go beyond using audio description as simply an accommodation. In full disclosure, I've known Dr. Klieg for nearly 20 years now. Dr. Klieg is Professor Emerita of English at UC Berkeley. She is a writer, activist, and I am going to call you an audio description expert. Um, <laughs> um, um, a lot of her work has focused on describing the, her dissatisfaction with standards of audio description as it is currently practiced in the United States today. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about Dr. Klee right now. MJ. Okay. So I'm going to read Emily's um, bio from the website, if it's fine. Let me just turn the mic a little bit here. Okay, Emily Louise Hosiax is an artist and a sculptor. She received her BFA from the Cooper Union School of Art in 2014, and MFA from Yale University in Sculpture in 2019. Since losing her vision in 2010, Hosiak's alter experience of the world has seen her practice grow, finding inspiration in dreams, memories, sensuality, and non-visual sensory perceptions. Relying solely on her sense of touch and proprioception, she demonstrates a profound sensitivity towards texture, space, and material. Please join me in welcome Emily to MCU today. Thank you. And Georgina. And Georgina. <laughs> um, I, just to pick up on, on a theme that Elaine touched on, because it's something that I'm saying all the time uh, when I talk about uh, blindness and art, and it is the idea that accommodations that were originally designed for uh, blind and visually impaired people <clears throat> actually do benefit everybody. And I'll just give an example, a sort of pandemic example. I don't know about you all, but uh, for many of us during pandemic lockdown, when museums were shuttered and a lot of their programming went online, and because I care about art and I care about museums, I, I would tune in to these programs. And I started to notice really quite systematically that um, people speaking, you know, they were showing images. There was an image on the screen and people were speaking. And they were employing the techniques of audio description, not because they thought there was a blind person, in, any blind people in the audience, but because they recognized that, you know, no matter what the resolution of the image on the screen, it wasn't the same as being in the gallery. And so they had to enhance that even for a sighted audience with language. And so, you know, it, I, I feel like it's important not to make this stark disti distinction, oh, there's audio description, that's for the blind people. We're talking to the blind people kind of scared of the blind people. Um, so scholars of art history and visual culture have, have always done is using language to describe a visual experience. And so it can benefit blind and visually impaired people, but it, it benefits anybody who's, who's listening. Um, I have been working, um, researching with audio description um, and other forms of description um, since I started working at the Met in 2015. Um, and it was the first time the educators at the museum had ever, um, I guess, came across this type of description in mm -hmm. all text. And um, since working um, at the Met and 
um, as an artist, I've noticed a lot has changed. I have gone to a lot of Zoom mm -hmm. um, online events, um, especially the NYU Disability Center has a really great online uh, Zoom um, lecture series. One of the most exciting um, way that IU description has been utilized um, in an art practice that I um, saw part of this lecture series was the artist Jordan Lord, um, who's a video artist. He made some short video documentaries. Um, and he was, what was so exciting is that he like, made the description part of the video. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have a choice to like turn it on or off. It was just there. He had the subjects of his videos narrate or do a voiceover of what was what they were seeing, as they were, um, so they were describing what they were seeing as they were watching the mm -hmm. video, um, and in the, and it was just so powerful because it was so personal. And Georgina, I forgot to talk to you about this on the train, but I <laughs> believe you were at the Sheds. Uh, performance of Kinetic Light. Yes. Yeah. And they did an amazing thing where they had, I think, like eight or nine different yeah. describers describing the same performance. And you could choose which description you wanted to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the Kinetic Light is a, um, a dance company of uh, disabled dancers. And they created their own app. They have a kind of maybe a standard audio description. They have various versions by various people that are more poetic. Mm -hmm. You could hear them breathing. You could hear, I think you could hear their heartbeats. Wow. So it was like a, a more visceral right. uh, audio element. Yeah. Uh, they've been experimenting with it for a while, and it's really innovative and mm -hmm. great. Yeah. I'm really glad you said that about. Um, that one of the descriptions was written by a poet, mm -hmm. because I've often thought um, that audio description might be best done by poets, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's so much about um, really careful word selection. And um, Jesse, uh, shout out to you with your descriptions earlier. I thought they were really beautiful and poetic. Go to their website, All Text is Poetry. Um, they have workbooks, they have examples. It's really a wonderful. Uh, resource and it's yeah. very, I, I, they're they're lovely. They're whimsical. They're you know they're poetic. It's it's uh, they're they're really breaking new ground in terms of description. Great. If you could say one thing about traditional audio description that bugs you, that you wish wasn't that way. You want me to limit to one no. thing? Because <laughs> <laughs> I think there's been a lot of pushback by disgruntled consumers such as myself. What I think is a totally misguided uh, belief that it must be objective. Mm -hmm. It yeah. must be, you know, without any uh, personal opinion or interpretation. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that, I can sort of understand why that came to be, but anybody who thinks about, anybody who th thinks, um, <laughs> we'll know that the begin that you begin the moment you start to describe anything, you are expressing an interpretation, you are expressing an opinion. Mm -hmm. Get an audio description of a film or something, where the person is told that they must be objective and they can't uh, interpret everything. So they would say, she turns the corners of her mouth upward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because to say she's smiling is an interpretation. Um, anyway, so you know, you'd hear this, and for 20 minutes I sit there tearing my hair out, and then I miss, you know, those 20 <laughs> minutes of the show. So I, you know, I've said for a long time, it's like, it's subjective, embrace the sub subjectivity. Just go with it. Um, we're talking about like, like movies and films mm -hmm. and description, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the 
the, the landscape of audio description and television and movies has changed a lot um, since I first started listening to audio description films and I just really didn't get a feeling that I was in the world mm. with them. But I feel like that has changed a lot um, for the better. I actually um, just recently was part of a, a um, consultant group on audio description and alt text and how to best, what are best practices for um, for people um, who are not only just like consumers of it, but are creators of it, like how important it is. I feel like personally it's important for the describers to be um, like paid you know, for the work that they do. <laughs> um, which is frustrating because I noticed that every museum that I've worked with, just they ask every artist to write a description of the work that they're presenting in the museum and love and labor. But I feel like it should be, there should be more credit for the people that create it. Uh, if you can share with us an experience of a description that you loved in a museum, in a gallery, with a painting, with a sculpture, uh, something that you really enjoy the audio description or the verbal description. Oh, um, I tend to like, um, personally, I like going to a museum and being there in um, in person without the audio description, I personally really enjoy um, having a conversation one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with a person or with a group of people and getting more than one perspective. Um, do you feel that way, Georgina? Um, yeah, and I think, I would say museums have made a lot of advances around that, and I think it, it has co come from direct feedback from people who attend those programs, mm -hmm. you know. I, you know, people ask me that question all the time about, you know, give me a good example. And I've, I've become more and more resistant to answering that question, mainly because I don't have an answer, but also because I think sometimes it, it uh, closes down mm -hmm. people's uh, imagination or mm -hmm. I innovation. <laughs> that kind of takes it out of context. And so the risk is that people say, oh, that's a good one, I'll just copy that. Mm -hmm. And then you put it in a different context and it just it do doesn't work. Um, but I think some, you know, it's sometimes that, you know, I would turn the question back to, to you, MJ, and say, what, what's a good description for you? Mm -hmm. And you might say, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not blind. And yet still, you're responding to language and, and what somebody's saying, even if you can see it. Like to me, it makes sense when they ask, when they tell me like an anecdote, yeah. something that happened during the process. Yeah. Oh, I remember your examples of Jason Pollock with the dripping, um, uh, the dripping, the technique, and to me that's interesting to, mm -hmm. know, to know the technique. Yeah. I like, I like that aspect yeah. of the process more than the product. <laughs> yeah, I like the. Pro I I like to know. I like to know how things are made, mm -hmm. and sometimes knowing how something was made kind of tells you what it looks like mm -hmm. you know totally. exactly. right so we're not supposed to look at a painting and just feel nothing oh but mm -hmm. see that it's what its content is we're supposed to feel something yeah and and so when it's described using poet poem poetic language or you know metaphor and other kinds of um, context that can move us right it's that's mm -hmm. really um, powerful even for me as a sighted person like I get more out of it Mm -hmm. You know, you know. I find myself often asking what are kind of naive but profoundly essential questions. <laughs> so it's like, how does it make you feel? Why is it hanging here in this museum? Why, what, what draws you to this painting? And how did that happen? Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to think about your emotional response and then also look again at the painting and say, okay, why did I? Why was I attracted to that? You know, a serious art historian doesn't necessarily say, oh, this makes me feel such and so. And I always wonder if, if sighted people mention some elements that a non-sighted audio describer would say, no way. 
um, I think describing the texture of a, of a sculpture or a painting or a drawing is really important to me um, mm -hmm. because you, not just to, not to focus so much on like the visual of the piece, but also to, to talk about like the texture and the, the way, how much, like how it would feel if you held it in your hand, like is it heavy? But when I was writing descriptions also for my, my work that was up in the Welcome Collection that focused a lot on memory and color, like color was uh, it is such a subjective thing. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. difficult to describe. Um, and f as a blind artist, I described colors a lot as like physical sensations too, um, or emotional. Like for the color scarlet, I um, I associated that color with like a really bad sunburn, hmm. <laughs> something that is so painfully hot. You know, uh, but so I'm trying to think of like Emily. Emily's talking about when a blind artist is writing their own description mm -hmm. of things, um, and in that case, yeah, a blind artist is, is probably more likely to talk about process mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, construction or you know how both thought process, but also the kind of fit, how did I put this thing together? How was it made? Um, I would say wholeheartedly, any chance I have to get my hands on art, yeah. I jump at it. Mm -hmm. And whether somebody's talking to me or describing or there's a text attached is secondary. It's because the standard touch tour is typically designed and led by sighted people. <laughs> and there's an idea that the point of touching the art is to be a substitute for sight. Huh. And kind of a sorry substitute for a side, you know. And so it becomes this almost like this guessing game of, all right, you can touch this. Is it a dog or a horse? <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, the point of touching art, and this is why my current advocacy is that everybody should get to touch the art. The problem is that because <coughs> there are such rigid hands-off policies, you know, People don't know how to do it. Blind people don't know how to do it, you know. And so I think museums have a role to, to play in sort of training people about kind of mindful, respectful, tactile and haptic engagements with art. It's, it's not a mystical thing, you know. I have a systematic way of doing things. And I, can, I could show you, and you would appreciate the experience. funny because I feel like a lot of sight people are worried about blind people touching things like they're gonna knock something over uh. but it, what you said is true I feel like we are the most experienced with touching artwork and exploring through touch that we have a, a sensibility we know how to touch things mm -hmm. mindfully like you said yeah I have more questions but I want to give the the opportunity to the students and to the audience to pose that questions. And if not, I will keep on. Okay. Um, your process behind how you do things. Yeah. Um, my process is I, I always start um, everything with a drawing. Um, so a lot of my my drawing process is like also like a slow meditative process. So. Um, a lot of my sculptures start out as drawings. A lot of my paintings or bigger drawings start out as smaller drawings. Like one day I'll go to the studio and I'll have a, nice, a perfect idea of like, this is the size it needs to be, um, so that we make it that size. Um, and my assistant is actually in the audience. His name is Kirby. Um, and we've been, <laughs> we've been working together for three years. Hi there. Um, so my name is Crystal. I happen to be in a very unique situation. We're beginning the process of starting a museum at Hinchliff Stadium in the very beginning to make our uh, museum a, a, a fully inclusive, uh, a thoughtful uh, gallery from the start instead of having to sort of go back and incorporate things in. 
you sort of answered your own question because uh, access is always better when it's in the design from the outset rather than, you know, tacked on later. It's like, oh my God, we have to put a ramp somewhere. Um, I would say, it's a museum in a stadium? Yeah. Uh, is it an art museum or is it a... a yeah, it'll yeah. be an art and history museum okay. um, about the stadium itself, which was oh. uh, one of very few uh, Negro League stadiums that are still standing. Oh, mm. huh. Um, for instance, if you're going to have elements of, that are touchable, they're objects that are meant to be touchable. For instance, like an architectural model. To recognize that once you bring touch into the museum, it, it changes everything. It changes time and space. So think about moving, rather than having everything against the wall, having things in the center so that people can access them from multiple sides. Um, think about de audio delivery. So, you know, now there are these various kinds of directional audio speakers that can deliver some kind of audio description or some kind of, you know, uh, um, maybe record it, historical archival recordings or something to enhance uh, visual stuff. Oh, I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, people always want to go to the technology, you know, and sometimes it's like you just need to think about people coming into this space mm -hmm. and how do they move from place to place. That there's a kind of a the movement re replicates chronology, you know, we start in 1902 and then we go to 1910, you know, and so, so on and so forth. And um, is that the best way to go, or is there a more thematic arrangement of material? So there, there are a lot of those types of questions. I mean, I think chronology is kind of intuitive for most people, particularly in a historical setting. But that also speaks to navigation. It's like, if I enter in 1902, I know that 2002 is going to be over there, you know. I don't know. Do you, you, you've worked in museums, so you can, <laughs> Emily, you can. Not like that, though. <laughs> don't design museums. Is music ever used in auto descriptions, and does that help the the experience of with an art piece? Mm. It's what? Music. Music, music used. Is ever used in the audio description? Um, I can't. I can't think of an example offhand, but it's it's kind of appealing. Mm -hmm. And I could see particularly using music of a particular historical period mm -hmm. to give the mood of mm -hmm. something that's being described. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've listened to some audio description where they incorporated music from a time period. Uh, like a Dutch delight painting and there'd be flutes playing mm. <laughs> yeah. in the background. Yeah. Um, but I know some um, <coughs> deaf artists who work with closed captioning describe, like think about how to describe a sound, you know, that they can't hear. My name's Colleen and, um, and I haven't seen a list for Blind describers yet? Can you lead us to one? I don't know if there is a list. That would be a good idea. <laughs> uh, Thomas Reed, uh, who has a podcast called Read My Mind, spelled R-E-I-D. That's the spelling of his name. And there are a lot of, a lot of episodes that are around audio description. Uh, he is himself a, 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 a uh, audio describer, in addition to his work as a podcaster. He's a, a blind uh, uh, person. Um, I think actually the audio description at MoMA of, of some Jackson Pollock is pretty good because they do talk about, there's a lot of paint, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember a, an audio track at MoMA's, and I think you can get this on their, their website, where they had a conservator talking about conserving a Jackson Pollock because there's so much paint. So it's like, describe Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. 
well, you know, taking a kind of neutral objective approach isn't going to do you much, much good. I'm thinking also of maybe, um, you know, color, color field artists, uh, you know, Mark Rothko or something, where, you know, what do you, if you're doing an objective description, you say, well, the top half is sort of pink and the bottom half is kind of brown. <laughs> um, but there, I think, a description that talks about the experience of staring at those paintings. They are talking about the subjective experience of a describer saying, well, I'm sitting here, and at first it looks like this, and then this is happening, and th this is happening. And then I get closer, and I see that there's actually there's underpainting that's a totally different color that doesn't show when you're standing over here. And that kind of, you know, de describing the experience of the painting rather than describing what's actually on the canvas, for me, mm -hmm. is, is more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So we can move to the second part of the sure. event, which is the ad hoc uh, audio description practicum. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this uh, photo is taken in Madrid, Contemporary Art Exhibition Biennale uh, in January. And then I got to know Emily's work in Madrid. True love will find you in the end. In the end of what, I would ask? <laughs> at the end of the year, at the end of my life, <laughs> when will I find true love? <laughs> okay. True love will find you in the end, 2021 is my sculpture installation composed of two figura figurative sculptures made of a styrofoam, steel, and paper mache coated with a transparent matte varnish. Both sculptures are about a meter and a half tall, and together they occupy a meter and a half of space from left to right. The sculptures depict two hybrid figures standing side by side, holding hands, with their heads slightly turned to look at each other. On the right, there is a naked woman with a dog's head. The figure on the left is an anthropomorphized dog with a long tail standing on, on its hind legs with a woman's head. I made both sculptures to be about the same height and proportions as, as me, and the body of the dog is modeled after my guide dog, London who is an English Labrador. The sculptures look like smooth stone and are light gray, with some variations of darker gray. The dog's nose, lips, and eyes are painted black, as are the eyes and eyebrows on the woman's face on the dog's body. There are other details on the figures. For example, the navel on the woman's belly and six small nipples on the dog's stomach. The sculptures are looking at each other with affection. This is my description of Emily's sculpture um, as taken, it's a photograph um, taken by MJ during a tour at, at the same art Biennial. The sculpture is of two naked creatures, apparently made of plaster of pa plaster of Paris paper mache or concrete. They look off-white in color. The two figures are human size in dimension. On the left, closer to the front in the picture, is a figurine of a dog standing on its hind legs. It has a tail off its backside and a human woman's head in place of the dog's head. The head is looking to her left at the second figure. The second figure is that of a woman standing upright and facing towards the dog figure. She has the head of a dog. Not part of the sculpture, but part of the photograph, there is another real-life human, presumably a blind woman, touching the sculpture. The museum visitor has a black guide dog to her left, with the harness loose but the leash over her arm. And her hands are holding the hands of the sculpture, one on the dog's hand, one on the woman's hand, making a full circle of touch. The dog is looking down and unfortunately not sniffing the sculpture or raising a paw to the fake dog or otherwise partaking in the, quote, touch tour. However, both the dog and their human are standing inside the black taped off floor marker that signals to the museum attendees the distance they need to stay away from the art. Uh, you know, it's detailed. It's not overwhelmingly detailed. 
um, I get a sense of the, the scale, the size, a meter and a half tall, a meter and a half wide, basically. And then the, the, the two figures. Um, it goes from the sort of general of the figures. There's a woman with a dog's head, a, dog, a dog's body with a woman's head. And then it gets into more details about the navel and the, the nipples. And the, uh, so it goes from a kind of out in, you know, out, outward in. And what's interesting to me about Elaine's description, which I actually read before I had read Emily's description, so it, it has a certain eminence <laughs> um, in, in my mind, is that, um, uh, that you, you have the first figure and the second figure, mm -hmm. and you're reading from left to right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. And um, uh, so that was interesting, sort of orientation of, you know, in English, we read from left to right, and so that, that, that's how that works. Um, but of course, what's what's so appealing is the description of the of the human, <laughs> the real life person <laughs> um, uh, participate. You know, taking taking the hands of the two figures, um, and you know, it almost sounds it sounds like you know they're going to dance together. So it, you, your your description kind of tells a little story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, with full credit, that was MJ's picture. So it was the picture that took, mm -hmm. told the yeah. story yeah. to really, um, yeah. yeah. But thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Yeah, I liked how the Elaine, your description, kind of like um, that in, in the picture that includes a, a blind person, a blind woman, and, a, and her guide dog. Um, that is what I'm depicting in my sculpture mm -hmm. and like that kind of circle of touch and interaction um, is kind of like brought to life except the dog is indifferent which is, as dogs are <laughs> 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 when ex like experiencing art yeah um. <laughs> um, so I wrote this piece we should let Georgina touch it first so that we can have like a, a base or a pedestal I already took it off the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually in museums it's bolted down. I don't get to do this. So. <laughs> this is why I, we love this gallery, because we can touch the objects. And I was asking Sherita, the gallery director, about this event and if we could do some practice with the description and touching the objects. And she said, of course. So this is why I like this place. <laughs> so my question to you would be like, Georgina, um, when you are touching, uh, let's what you mentioned, identifying objects versus experience yeah. them. So what are your insights? Well, first of all, I'm really intrigued by this medium, mm -hmm. which feels waxy to me. Mm -hmm. It is. I think it's um, wax. And I'm resisting my natural tendency, my natural desire, which is to like scratch it. <laughs> um, but it's very satisfying, it's really cool to touch. Um, because texturally, and the in there are, there's an interior and exterior yeah. thing going on. Yeah. Um, and the interior spaces, there's a lot of smooth, very smooth, almost slick textures. Um, it's very attractive to the touch because there are these intricacies. You can stick your fingers in different places and then over here and it's, oh, it's my finger is over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so it's quite delightful. Um, to me, it, if it rep represents anything literally, I. And then I'm thinking, yeah, how did you make that? Um, you know, is it carved? Is it, you know, are there pieces? So now, now I'm investigating to see, are there seams? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for construction elements to think about. Um, I mean, there is a straight line along here, but I don't think it's a seam. I think it's a drip. Um, you know, so I don't think it was molded. So it's not really about what it looks like. 
I'm imagining it's white-ish. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, ew, this is interesting. <laughs> there are some parts that are quite uh, thin. Mm, my compliments. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get that feedback. Yeah, I can pass it to Emily. Emily, you want to touch it? Oh, yeah. Can I put it in your hands? It's a little bit heavy. Oh, oh wow. But I, I'm going to put the chair in front of you in case that you oh, want to rest it. thank you. Sure. And I was wondering if some of the students in oh, this wow. class or my class would like to offer an audio description, a verbal description accompanying the tactile exploration. Mm. Yeah, it's a yeah. participatory description. I'm like right here, but I can't really tell. Is it, are the hands like interlocking or are they just like... I think they're just in the Say that again, I didn't hear you. I think they're just on top of each other instead of interlocking. Oh. Mm -hmm. Stack on top of each other. Yeah, go ahead. Kino. Yeah. Uh, for me, it like, looks like a mountain, like uh, made by hands. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it looks like a, a plate with like uh, hands on, on the top of the plate, ready for it to be eaten. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's, yeah. That's great. Everyone grabbing for the same thing. <laughs> and what about oh. the unit? Oh, because of the, the surface that it's right, on. Right, the surface yeah. is like a plate. And they're like fingers, like mm -hmm. some of the hands have fingers that are missing, but the, the fingers are on top of the plate. It's mm -hmm. like they melt it away, or mm -hmm. deliberately they put in the fingers there. And look at us, hands on top of hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the dog thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're putting our hands on top of that mountain of yeah. hands. How important is the color of what it is? How important is the color? They're asking uh, what it is. Um, I mean, when I'm touching it, I automatically, like, because I know, I can recognize the material, I automatically, I know what beeswax or paraffin wax looks like. Mm. Um, so I don't, I, 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 I just know that's what the color is, but if you had told me that it is black or Pink, I'd be more, I'd be very surprised mm -hmm. and happy to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's white. <laughs> you know, in some sense, the, the fact that it looks like hands uh, is, is kind of secondary to me because the, um, the experience of the form itself is so interesting. And Part of what is so interesting to me is the negative space. It's like mm. that I can reach my hand all the way in here. For me, it's never about how this correlates to how it looks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sometimes interesting to hear that from people. They say, oh, it looks like hands. Oh, well, that's interesting. And it's sort of cool because, you know, it's the touch, it's the like yeah. hands, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I have a meaningful experience with this, this piece without necessarily understanding that or knowing that you know yeah um, oh. and this this will stay in my in my mind's hands memory for a long time um, so <laughs> and I have a question um what what about the intention of the artist of the artist himself or herself are you interested in those details that type of information about the intention or not really when you hear an audio description oh Definitely, I'd be interested in knowing. Yeah, I always, I always like when an audio description, if there's some text that was written or, you know, an interview or something mm -hmm. uh, where an artist has said something about the work, I'm always interested mm -hmm. in that. Um, I don't really like filling in the blanks <laughs> of a description. Um, sometimes the description will fill in the blanks that way, but so, like, if I can feel an object and simultaneously have a description, then I feel like that is um, most helpful. Um, but I do rely a lot on my memory. Mm. Um, so, like, I have, you know, taken art history classes and I've seen abstract paintings and I know, like, what it means if you say this is a cubist painting or this mm. is a... Uh, abstract impre expressionist painting or uh, impressionist painting, I I understand what that looks like. So, 
So I'm really relying a lot on um, my memory. So in that way, I'm, I can kind of fill in the blanks and make assumptions about works of art. But it doesn't necessarily feel like, I mean, filling in the blanks feels like a, you know, it's sort of a, a, a judgment on the description. Mm -hmm. It's like the description is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then I have a brain, and my brain <laughs> does what it does. And so, you know, there's, there's maybe a, a kind of dialogue, but it's not necessarily a, a filling in, a, you know, filling in uh, inadequacies or something. Georgina said about the memory that it will stay in your memory, this the, the difference between the visual memory and haptic mm -hmm. memory, right? Yeah. That when you touch it, it's going to be in your memory. Um, so I was wondering also that aspect about haptic memory. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things about touch is that it's sequential. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it plays out over time. And although I don't think it's true, we have, have this idea that vi vision is instantaneous. You can see it, and you know it, and you can go home. You know, um, but touch takes time, but but that's a virtue, right? You know, yeah. Uh, I mean, the more time I spend touching this thing, the the more I'm enjoying it, and the more memorable it is, and you know, the more I'll think about it when I go home. I mean, we kind of open this conversation by saying, you know, what, um, you know, what does the sort of benefit of you know touch bring mm -hmm. to all of us? as museum goers. Because when you touch something, you do have to spend more time with it. So in the more time you spend with something, the more con intimate you become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the, that is a way of bringing all, making art accessible to all people, right? To have mm -hmm. time to spend reflecting on it, how it makes you feel. And I was wondering, what is that experience versus this experience that Georgina cannot stop touching there? <laughs> <laughs> For example, in terms of the connection, in terms of the, how, how does it enhance the artistic experience. There is something, there is something that elevates the artistic experience when you are able to touch. Mm -hmm. I get bored of samples <laughs> in museums, especially because they tend to pull out the same samples. But um, I kind of like because there's like samples get circulated over and over again in touch stores. I kind of like. <clears throat> I, I, I don't mind 3D printed models. They provide information, which is useful, mm. but they're not necessarily an aesthetic experience. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes uh, museum educators think, think of them as, as the same thing. Um, mm. So I think a, a distinction needs to be made about what, what am I getting out of the, uh, touching this? Is it just to get some right. information, or is it really to? Yeah. Experience what's going on. I have a question. What is the name of that piece? Um, I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me in the back. Burnout by Walla Shapin. You know, I'm a trained academic, so you know, I, it's like I, I can go to the museum and then I know I can go home and I can look something up and right. find out more information later yeah. that I can then, you know, tack on to my memory of the experience in the museum, so. And I think um, as far as question, official Q&A and discussion, we're um, about out of time. But I would like to invite all of you, and we have a reception in the room next door.